This is Marion Borgeson. Um, I'm on the advisory board of the Schumacher Center for a New Economics and uh, also a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Defense Council. I'm really delighted to be here today with Michael and Judy. Um, these lectures are a series that are in celebration of 40 years of the Schumacher Society's lectures. And these have been captured over the 40 years um, with video, but also in writing in, many, in most cases. And I know, I imagine that many folks who are joining today have enjoyed those lectures over time and probably have even read the lectures or maybe even attended the lectures of Judy and Michael in the past. Um, we have the pleasure of getting both of these two together today. Um, they have been collaborators for a long, long time. Um, so I'm gonna introduce them. Um, we're gonna ask a series of questions. And then um, the audience, all of you guys can add um, your own questions in the Q&A. Um, the chat has been disabled, so just go directly to the Q&A if you have questions along the way. Um, we'll be calling those and looking at those as we go. Um, so thanks everyone for joining us and thanks to Michael and Judy for being here as well. Um, so these two um, characters, and I think character is the right term for these, uh, these two, um, have been doing um, really important work around local economies for decades, for a really, really long time. And I met both, both of them about 20 years ago when I had just gotten out of college. Um, and I basically wound up on the steps of the White Dog Cafe through various channels. Um, and we have Judy Wicks, who is an entrepreneur, a writer, a speaker, a leader, um, who has been doing work um, in her community and has figured out ways of making her own experiences and her own passion for the things she does um, into much broader and much wider um, impacts and inspired many others as well. So she's gonna be talking about some of her work there. And then Michael um, is a, an economist, an attorney, an entrepreneur, an author. He speaks all the time. I think it's like weekly. He's giving talks at least. <laughs> and he's always funny and insightful and full of heart while talking about like economics and money and stuff that often can feel cold and distant. Um, he's the director of local economy programs for the Neighborhood Associates Corporation. And I'd say there's two, at least two main things that these folks have in common. One is integrity. When I met them 20 years ago, they were clear about their mission and vision and where they were going and what was important to them. And I think integrity is probably only measured in years, right? You can be, um, have some ideas for one year, but these folks have been carrying these, these ideas out over many decades. And I think that's really the true test of integrity. So you can kind of see that in the tra trajectory of their work. Um, they also both share um, heart, like they bring love and attention to everything they do. Um, and they make that the personal um, wider and more accessible to everyone else. So the things that they love most and they care about most, they're able to sort of make that a part of every piece that they do and share it with so many others. Um, so we're really um, lucky today to have both of these two here. And in this sort of weird virtual world where we're all Zooming, usually we're you know, at some cozy, beautiful lecture hall in the Berkshires talking about these issues where it feels you know, like you get a sense of place here I am with this white background. You have no idea where I might be lurking. Um, I, I think we'll just start with just each of us talking a little bit about where we are. I am on my bed in my bedroom, hiding from my two children. Um, <laughs> and I have construction work going on downstairs. So I'm hoping that won't interrupt the flow of this important conversation. Um, but I am grateful to be here in my home, in my place. Um, and, and in this time when we're sort of able to rethink like what's actually important to us because our normal schedules, our normal commutes, et cetera, are disrupted. It's this really important time where you can think, you know, maybe I should be spending time playing at the beach with my kid instead of working all day. So I think this is a special time, even though it's so challenging in so many ways, um, both in the, in the health aspects, as well as um, our, our economy and sort of socially, where, you know, there's a lot of struggle going on. Um, but that's where I am. I'm in California, in Berkeley, California in my bedroom. I'll, I'll go to Michael. Where are you, Michael? Tell us a bit about your place. Well, before I tell you that, I do want to say Judy and I have a third thing in common, which is a rather uh, healthy adoration of animals. Uh, so she, the adoration of dogs, and me, the adoration of moose. So you can see my intern here. Um, and I'm talking to you today from uh, Wheaton, Maryland. So I live just on the outskirts of the District of Iniquity, Washington, D.C. 
Uh, and uh, I've been living here for 30 plus years. And it's the first time in my life since I was in college that I have not traveled for four months. Wow. That's saying a lot. What about you, Judy? Where are you at? Well, I wanted to welcome everyone to my cabin in the woods. Um, I'm in the, um, in the Pocono Mountains in my home state of uh, Pennsylvania. And um, coincidentally, uh, I'm in the place uh, where I actually met Michael uh, in that in July of um, 2001, um, we held the founding retreat for Bali, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, uh, where we had about 25 people, all members of a Social Venture Network, now called Social Venture Circle, um, from all over the country, California, Chicago, Massachusetts, and so on, who are interested in local economies. And uh, one of the uh, SVN members um, mentioned Michael Schumann, who wrote a book called Going Local. And we are so excited. Um, and invited Michael to come to our retreat. Um, and that was the first time that Michael and I actually spoke together um, because we were the two speakers for our retreat. And I remember we, we were asked to say, what does sustainability mean to each of you and what does local mean to each of you? Um, and that's how we began the, the dialogue um, 19 years ago, almost to the day. Um, and um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, Michael and I have spoken together man many times since, uh, so it's great to be here today. And I always think of us as being kind of the, the yin and yang or the, um, the head and heart, you know, of the movement. Um, and um, Michael brought uh, to, to us, we were a group of entrepreneurs, um, kind of the intellectual um, background and research, uh, you know, into local. Um, and so I still remember the line Michael said something about how um, th that we can move wealth and power from distant corporations to our own communities, you know, by, by uh, building local economies. And that is still like a, such a key thought. And I thank Michael, um, you know, uh, for that and many other things that he added to the conversation. Great. Thanks. So let's, Judy, let's, you can, Let's dig a bit more into sort of the evolution that you've gone through over the last 20 years. Where were you 20 years ago and how did you come, like what's your evolution in terms of your thinking and the work that you're doing every day over that time? Yeah, um, well, let's see. Um, I, uh, looking back at my uh, Schumacher talk of uh, 2004, I, I realized uh, that my focus at that time in my life was on my business, the White Dog Cafe. Um, and I wanted to um, I thought that the best thing one could do um, when running a business is to use the triple bottom line of, uh, as our measurement of success, not just profit, but how, what is our impact on nature and on other people. Um, so that, you know, I thought is if I have good practices within my company, you know, uh, buying from local farmers, using renewable energy, um, paying a living wage, composting, all these things, that that was, that was enough. That was my goal. So my first transformational moment that really led uh, to my current work um, was um, a time in which I had great pride in having established relationships for buying uh, free range pigs um, and grass fed beef and free range chickens and so on and, and had a whole uh, network of farmers supplying the white dog. And that was our market niche. That was our competitive advantage. Um, and then all of a sudden it dawned on me that if I really did care about the farm animals and cared about the environment that was being polluted by industrial farming, I cared about the consumers eating, you know, products that were full of pesticides and hormones and whatnot, that rather than keeping my supplier supply list to myself as my competitive advantage, that I would share it with my competitors. And that was a moment um, that Otto Scharmer uh, defined as when I moved from me to we. <laughs> Because I realized that it's not enough just to have good practice within your company. You have to work with others um, to build a, um, a whole economy based on those values. Um, and so that, that is still the, the moment uh, for me that uh, changed my life. Um, because from then on, I started thinking about the system. What is the, the whole system in which my business and my household is a part? And how, how do we work together to, to transform that system? Um, so, um, and I feel like I was able to make that decision, which, you know, it's unusual for a business person to do um, because of the influence of indigenous people in my life, uh, that I lived in an Eskimo village for a year when, when I was out of high school. And there I saw in action 
um, an economy that was based on sharing um, and uh, community and cooperation, as opposed to the culture in which I grew up that was based on competition and, and uh, showing success by what we have materially. Um, where the, the Eskimos were so uh, such happy people, and I realized it was because their their happiness and their sense of security was not based on money and material objects. It was based on community. That that's where their sense of security and happiness uh, came from. So the next transformational moment for me also came from my relationship with Indigenous people, and I'm starting to put two and two together here as I look back at my life, uh, how how this is uh, transformed me. And that was when I heard about the Zapatista uprising um, on on the day that NAFTA went into effect, January first, nineteen ninety four, and went to Chiapas because I was so um, curious about why. Um, and from the Zapatistas, I learned that their, their revolution was about something I never thought about, and that was local self-reliance, that they wanted to have the right to grow their own crops, to sell them in the, in the, in the domestic marketplace, to provide for their family, um, and not do as NAFTA was intended to do, to draw them into the uh, global economy where they would end up um, um, outcompete, uh, outcompeted, which did happen uh, by industrial corn farmers from the United States dumping uh, corn in, in Mexico and causing a great uh, immigration. But I, I, I could go into all, all this detail <laughs> along the way, but I, I can't do that. So let me just keep moving along here. So um, I realized, you know, even though I had um, uh, gone to uh, Chiapas uh, to um, uh, it, it find ways in which I could help the Zapatistas. And we did have projects to help them with their, with their coffee businesses. But um, what, I, what I realized is what was happening to the Zapatistas and their fight for local self-reliance was happening all over the world. The communities everywhere were losing self-reliance um, and, and therefore our freedom uh, by becoming dependent on long distance supply chains uh, controlled by corporations to bring us our basic needs. Um, and so it was with that uh, that experience with the Zapatistas, that all of a sudden I, be, I had another transformational moment where I reimagined what the global economy could look like. That was one that was not do dominated by these big uh, corporate supply chains, but rather was this intricate network of, uh, of um, small to small, um, made up of um, regional economies um, that were just and sustainable, um, and uh, that produced their basic needs that they need to live on, you know, uh, food, shelter, energy, clothing, so on, uh, locally. And then we traded with each other uh, nationally and internationally um, um, for the, the things that we didn't have locally in exchange for what we had in excess or what we had that was special, you know, to our region, a special cheese or fashion or invention or whatever. Um, and so it was with that vision of a, how do we build a just and uh, a sustainable global economy? We build it by uh, creating just and sustainable regional economies that are, are linked. And so it was with that vision that I um, started Bali um, and you know, with my, my friends like Michael and Laurie Hamill um, uh, and David Corton. And David Corton often spoke, we had a trio of speakers, David and, and uh, Michael and me, and uh, David would go first with the big picture of corporations and then um, Michael with the, the facts around um, as an economist, and, and then me with, you know, kind of the practitioner's um, experiences, heart-based experiences. Um, so, um, okay, so that was, you know, that took up a lot of my life, really, uh, you know, wor working on Bali um, and, and running my business, and Bali really took me away, uh, further away from my business to be really a national speaker, to travel around to the Bali networks and so on, um, and so, so much so that eventually I decided to sell my my business in order to devote myself full time as a full time uh, localist um, uh, activist. So I sold the, the the white dog in 2009. I wrote my memoir, uh, Good Morning Beautiful Business, which was actually based on my Schumacher speech in 2004, which was also called Good Morning Beautiful Business. Um, you know about the beauty of business um, and how uh, you know my business was my way that I expressed my my love of life, my love for my community. It was my gift to my community. Um, and so it's always been for me that sort of the heart of this movement is entrepreneurship in that way. Um, so um, th that, uh, so I, I traveled a lot again after I wrote my book. Um, and then it was really, um, again, indigenous influence. In 2016, I went to Standing Rock um, and organized a, a, a Thanksgiving dinner uh, for the water protectors. Um, I checked with my indigenous friends to make sure that would be politically correct because <laughs> Thanksgiving has a lot of bad connotations as well. 
uh, and got to go ahead. Um, and we ended up uh, cooking Thanksgiving dinner for 2,000 people. That's a whole other story in itself. But while I was there, I really, um, I, I, um, uh, I was so moved by the indigenous people. Uh, they told the story of the black snake. The prophecy of the black snake was, was a thousand year old Lakota prophecy that one day a black snake would come out, out of the land and uh, go across the, the ground causing great uh, harm and, and sorrow. Um, and that they had figured out a thousand years later that the black snake uh, was, the, was the fossil fuel industry, the pipelines and so on. Um, and that if we didn't, uh, if the world did not unite to defeat the black snake, that the world would end, you know, and I believe that is so true. And that's the state is uh, uh, where we're at right now. And when we left Standing Rock, the elder said, go home and find the black snake where you live and kill the black snake. So I got back to Pennsylvania <laughs> and uh, realized that the black snake um, was fracking. Um, so I began, you know, to join groups to protest uh, the pipelines and whatnot. I got arrested. <laughs> I was part of the, of the drill rig five because we closed down a drill rig and so on. And that made me think again um, that my life has never been a, being against, against something as much as that is important, but it's always been about building, you know, building the alternative. So I realized that what, where my heart and soul was, as much as I am willing to protest, and I'm sure I'll protest again, <laughs> we're just protesting for Black Lives Matter, um, that most of my energy needed to go into creating the alternative, uh, the low carbon, locally based, just sustainable local economy in my own region at home. Um, and to model uh, what I feel um, needs to happen. Um, and, you know, one of the things that and I, in rereading my um, my 2004 Schumacher lecture, uh, that was always important to me was redefining growth. Um, how I felt that at Social Venture Network, our model was to grow our socially responsible companies bigger and bigger and bigger, so we could beat out the bad, irresponsible companies. But then what was happening is that Ben and Jerry's got sold to Unilever, the Body Shop to L'Oreal, Sony Field to Danone. Uh, and I thought this model is not working. That we, we cannot have continual growth as as our model. Um, and you know, as Donato Meadows points out, you know, on a finite planet, we can't have continuous growth. It's, we're going to kill the planet. So anyway, um, I started to think that okay, well, growth is a bad thing, but yet growth is a good thing too. So how how can we grow? So I I, I started to see how national brands and chain stores were like invasive species. Um, that they, uh, they invade other communities uh, and smother out uh, the indigenous um, businesses. So then I thought, well, how does nature grow? Well, nature, and this was so fortunate that nature's on our side of localism because nature grows deeper in place. Nature grows deeper in place to become more creative not to, not to be cookie cutter and spread your cookie cutter model around the country, Nature grows deeper in place to be more creative, more diverse, more resilient, and more um, in service to the needs of the ecosystem. And that's exactly how we have to grow our, our businesses and our economies um, to be in greater service to our communities. What does our community need? That's the kind of business that we start, not doing cookie cutters across the, the country. So um, this all led to my my coming home and looking to see how could we build such an economy at home. Um, and so that's when I started a year ago, uh, all together now, Pennsylvania, that we, just as in defeating the black snake, we have to come together, that we all have to come together to create this new um, economy, this um, just and sustainable local economy. Um, and I started with hemp because hemp, um, and that was something new since uh, my Schumacher lecture, that after 80 year ban, hemp has been um, legalized. And so I saw that uh, here was the chance uh, in a new industry to start from scratch, to build an industry that was inclusive, that worked in harmony with nature, um, that served the needs of our community. Hemp um, is like a miracle plant. You know, it, it provides food, uh, fiber, textiles, building supplies. Um, it regenerates the soil. It remediates the soil, it was used in Chernobyl to remediate the soil there. Uh, it's drought resistant. Um, I could go on and on. Um, so I, I started. Uh, I started with hemp, um, and we developed actually six coalitions: um, hemp, plant medicine, food, uh, renewable energy, uh, zero waste, and local tourism. 
Um, so I'll, I'll stop there um, 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 for now. <laughs> but um, that's sort of the, the short, uh, a shortened version of my evolution. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of themes there. I, I can see, you know, every every place you've landed has kind of connected back to place ultimately. Yeah. <laughs> and and then uh, you're always trying to share your story to inspire others. You can't just, I mean, I think this theme of we can't do it alone is, it's just simply universally true. Like as an individual entrepreneur, as an individual citizen in a country, yep. like there's no change that happens like sitting in our own place or just doing our own thing. But right. that way, you know, the way of actually connecting with others to create a movement is is really challenging work. So all the different ways you've done that have been super inspiring. Yeah. 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 And I do think, you know, that it's sometimes we think uh, that uh, it's just about coming together uh, to vote and that we can solve everything by voting people in office. But that is not uh, that is not enough. Um, mm -hmm. That we have to come together in everything we do. We have to be mindful about everything we do. Um, yeah. And uh, it's not just about the politics, it's about creating the world we want to live in. Uh, That's right. We all, we all play a role in that. Yeah, and I think this is a good transition to you, Michael, because you're looking at all the different ways many individuals are affecting the world through the way we invest, the way we, the jobs that we have. So why don't you talk about your transition or your evolution over the last 20 years? Yeah, well, um, one of the things you'll see very quickly is the biggest evolution is aging. Um, <laughs> see, Judy stays the exact same age, Marion, you stay the exact same age, but I have gotten older. I'm not sure I've gotten wiser, but we will see. So I, all of you who know me know I am a slideaholic. So I'm going to put up a couple of slides. Uh, just give me a second here. All right. And let us put it in slideshow. All right, <clears throat> so my talk for the Schumacher Society, when it was called that, um, back in 2007, um, was about local stock exchanges, uh, which I call the next wave of community economy building. Um, and it's really interesting, it's been really interesting for me to go back and read all of this. And, one of the other interesting things that happened in sort of preparation for this webinar today is Judy and I and Marion and I and Susan and the rest of us compared notes about the origins of things. So here's an early picture of Judy and me on her balcony uh, talking about stuff. And then um, in 2005, I decided uh, to put on a uh, a week-long seminar on local economies in Whidbey Island. And at the end of seven days of hard work where 30 people came, many of whom became prominent economic developers, uh, we had a little bit of a show. Some alcohol was involved. There may have been other things involved. I won't tell you where all these people are still working. They may not want me to reveal this. Uh, but also in this troupe of, of people like gaining some education was this woman here who apparently saw the light up high. And uh, this was how we hooked her into this movement in perpetuity. So uh, just a little bit of extra history here. You can never go back after Whidbey Island. That's right. That's right. Although I did go back to Whidbey Island and did work there a couple of years ago on the noise pollution by a bunch of Navy jets. And uh, I got the military so mad, they almost ran me out of there with pitchforks. But that's another, that is another story. So I want to kind of capture uh, a little bit what I thought I got right uh, in 2007 and what I got wrong, or at least what I missed, what I did not appreciate. And Certainly one of the things that I thought we all got right in 2007 is that we were right in our analysis of the economy. So this is just one snapshot of the kinds of studies that have come out. This was in the Harvard Business Review. Uh, it was a study that showed more small firms means more jobs. And it was a regression analysis across the country looking at those communities with the highest density of locally owned business 
they had the highest per capita job growth rate. And a ton of studies have come out in all kinds of places basically showing that local businesses are the best bet for economic development. We were also right, I think, in observing that the capital marketplace was incredibly broken. So I just created this very simple graph today. Uh, the left-hand side is a representation of the US economy. Uh, and what it shows is that 60% of the economy, uh, if you use a loose definition of local, uh, and there are other definitions you could use which would be even looser, but a, a, you know, a reasonable definition of local is that 60% of the jobs in the economy are in locally owned business. And yet when you look at the $56 trillion that Americans have in long-term investments in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, pension funds, insurance funds, it's close to 100% of that money is in the global 40%. It's actually even in much less because some of that 40% is big private business. And what it shows is how mismatched our capital allocation is. And one of the things I think we all became aware of in 2007 is that local businesses actually are quite competitive. Many are very profitable. In fact, you can make a good case that they're more profitable than Fortune 500 companies. And yet as investors, we systematically put all of our money in Wall Street and none of it in Main Street. And I think we were right to observe that if we were to fix this capital marketplace problem, and that's really what the idea of a local stock market was all about, was beginning to fix this marketplace. If you got the 60% that's in Wall Street now that belongs in local business into local business, this would work out to a capital transfer of about $100,000 per person. So take wherever you live, take the population, multiply by 100,000, and that is the importance of local investment. I think we had all of that buttoned down in 2007. What I did not appreciate was the law. I did not appreciate how malleable the law would be. So 2007, of course, was the year before the financial catastrophe, the last financial catastrophe. And what happened after that is that lots of people from many different perspectives said, the securities laws that are preventing us from investing in things in our own Main Street we're nuts and we had to change that. So a weird coalition of locavores on the left and Tea Party Republicans and high tech youth who wanted to do their apps and raise capital with that, we all came together and we convinced this guy who a few of you might remember uh, to sign into law something called the Jobs Act. So. This was the first and only time I was in the Rose Garden uh, for the signing of a bill that I was part of. And we did fundamentally change securities law and make local investing, at least through grassroots crowdfunding, investment crowdfunding, cheaper and easier. Uh, and what's happened since, so it took a few years to kind of get it through the SEC and FINRA, but starting in 2016, and between 2016 and now, about 400,000 Americans have put $340 million into grassroots business on several dozen portals. This one is WeFunder, one of the bigger portals. And a portal is basically an online marketplace that brings together grassroots investors and smallish businesses. And a couple of statistics about this. The average raised by the several thousand companies that have used crowdfunding successfully is $270,000. The average investment by an investor is $800. And the biggest beneficiaries by far 
have been entrepreneurs who are women and people of color. In other words, those entrepreneurs most excluded from the existing capital marketplace have been those who have been the biggest beneficiary of these reforms. Another thing that I did not appreciate in 2007 was that local investment was not just investment in local business. You can invest in yourself by, for example, getting yourself out of credit card debt and pre preventing all of those interest payments from going from your pocket to some outside bank. You can invest in your kids, help your kids get a house, help your kids get out of student loan debt. You can help your neighbors, uh, say, put a solar collector or forms of energy efficiency on their house. You can help your city by helping them purchase municipal bonds. Uh, and we can talk more about that. You can even help nonprofits go to your church or your other favorite nonprofit, and you can find ways of helping them buy their building, which bring down, brings down their costs and makes operations a lot smoother. So the whole universe of local investment was, is much, much bigger than I anticipated. And the tools that are available for local investment are much more robust than this, in a way, outdated idea of creating a miniature stock exchange, which is what I talked about in 2007. So this is a handbook that a group of us put out in January. It's free. It's called Community Investment Funds, a how-to guide for building local wealth equity and justice. And it's all about a kind of new generation of community funds that are focused on businesses dealing with racial equity, with local food, with affordable housing. And we're seeing all kinds of other interesting tools. In the Canadian provinces of British Columbia and Alberta, we're seeing investment co-ops. In the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, we're seeing neighborhood pension funds. In the Canadian province of New Brunswick, they've enacted a 50% local investment tax credit. So every dollar you put into a local business is 50 cents off your provincial taxes. This, by the way, has been introduced in the last month in the Michigan State Legislature, almost identical, a 50% income tax credit. So we're learning from our neighbors in the North in some good ways. Another thing that we're learning is do-it-yourself options, that you don't have to wait for your pension fund to get religion. You can invest locally yourself. So this is my newest book, Put Your Money Where Your Life Is, How to Invest Locally Using Self-Directed IRAs and Solo 401ks. Um, and there are simple tools for doing this. And the simplest and cheapest tool is available from a nonprofit group that I started with uh, Sustainable Economies Law Center and Lyft Economy called The Next Egg. And there for $300, a one-time charge of $300, we will help you set up your own solo 401k and you will be on your path to localizing your pension and other tax deferred savings. Here's what I think is interesting, you know, back in 2007, I said that there was a logical progression in the building of a local investment ecosystem, that you had to start by issuing stocks in a cheaper and easier way or issuing other securities from businesses in a cheaper way an easier way. And then we needed a place where people could exchange these things because no one wants to hold meaningless pieces of paper for the rest of their lives. And that's where I thought the local stock exchange was so important. But not everyone has the time and the bandwidth uh, to futz around with local investment. It takes a lot of energy. So that's why we put our money in funds. We want someone we trust to put together a portfolio of local securities, and we want someone to create a diversified fund so that it's less risky if one of those investments goes bad. 
And then the last link here is on pension funds, that institutions, whether they are workplace institutions or foundations or uh, government entities, they all have special rules on how they invest your long-term savings. And if we want that, you know, that's, that, that's kind of the last step here. And I thought that there was a natural arc in all of this. You know, that I, thinking from the perspective of big pension funds, they're never gonna move more than a trivial amount of money into local securities until there are proven investment funds that they know they can securely do that. And you're not gonna have a lot of local investment funds until those funds know what the value of their securities are. And that's one of the good things about local exchanges is that they give you a sense of the value of your stocks, bonds, whatever. And then you're not gonna have a real demand for local stock exchanges unless there's a critical mass of local securities. Well, what's so interesting is that everything has happened except what I predicted, um, which teaches one a little bit of modesty. That is, we've seen an explosion of local stock and securities. We've seen a spread of local investment funds. We've seen the emergence of new do-it-yourself tools to invest institutionally for yourself. But that local stock exchange remains on the to-do list. Uh, so perhaps if I was doing a Schumacher lecture today, I would talk about how it is the missing link. Let me stop there. Great, thanks. Let me ask a few questions from the audience before we go on to the next broader question. Uh, so Michael, just this question of um, return uh, comes from Ed Yarish here. And this sort of idea that you could invest in your neighbor like, is there a return from that? Or like, how does the return come in, in many of these models? Yes, so um, I will give you a very personal example of how the t return can come to you. Um, I was, it, it, also, also around the time I gave the Schumacher lecture was the time I became a divorced man. And that sent me on a very interesting financial journey in the wilderness over the next, decade or so. Um, and I wound up significantly in debt. And what the way that that debt, I was, I, for a couple of years, I, I managed that debt through credit cards and other like unbelievably expensive forms of credit. And I just decided, you know, that's, this is really insane. So I started approaching people that I knew and trusted and who knew and trusted me. And I said, let's, let's make a deal instead of my make, paying 20% every year to these credit card companies, how about I pay you 5%? Because I'm gonna argue that's probably what you'll get long-term from the stock market. Um, and I'll give you a few things as collateral on top of that. They got a good reliable investment localized in me. <laughs> I got a good reliable investment receipt. Uh, I. I estimate that as a result of crowdfunding around myself, I've saved close to $80,000. Wow. Wow. And it's based on trust. It's based <laughs> on trust. And yes. Yep. And, but all investment is based on trust. And that's yeah. what we forget about is that, you know, do we trust the corporations that are 10,000 miles away that are ravaging our communities and you can't even reach on an 800 number or yeah. do you trust your neighbors? And yeah. building that trust is part of what local economy building is all about. Yeah, yeah. one more question here about um, 401ks. And I think you mentioned at the end that this is a nut that hasn't been cracked yet. But this question is, is there what, what needs to be done to sort of make the, that, those funds accessible to invest in a nonprofit or a co-op or local investment funds? So. Here's the issue, 401ks are workplace investment plans and the rules around these plans make it very difficult for you to move around that money as long as you stay with that employer. Now, 
there are few examples out there of very creative employers who have made self-directed options available. And in fact, Judy and I were talking yesterday that uh, she, when she was running the white dog, gave her employees a self-directed option for their pensions. And, you know, there's, as I said, there's a few other examples like that, but by and large, your money is locked up. So the mm -hmm. secret sauce is create a solo 401k. A solo 401k is built for self-employed people. But if you have $1 on your Schedule C in your taxes, you are a self-employed person entitled to set up a solo 401k. So you create that solo 401k for $1. And with the next day, you could do the one-time fee of $300. And then when you leave your workplace, you roll over your funds into that solo 401k. And the beauty of the solo 401k is that you can put a lot more money in every year as opposed to a self-directed IRA. You also can make a loan to yourself. And why that's important is that, you know, usually with pension funds, you can't invest in yourself or the kids around you. But if you give a loan to yourself through a solo 401k, all of those other options open up for you. Mm -hmm. Great. I've got a question here also about, um, it's really about owning land. And this is a, it's a core theme of Schumacher over the years is, you know, land trust, like actually having land where the, the value doesn't balloon out of the, to make it unaffordable for folks who are living on it, whether as a business or as a, as a household. Um, we have a question here from Deborah Field about the rise in commercial rent in Portland, Oregon, and how many small businesses are essentially being pushed out because of those rent increases. And wondering, is there a way or any examples to develop one of these funds to actually purchase land? and um, yes. enable that sort of keeping that cost of land down. So there's two things that I encourage folks who are interested in this to look at. Um, one is, is in Portland. Um, it's a uh, community trust that was set up by um, Mercy, Mercy Corps. And I think that's their name, Mercy Corps. And they um, make it possible for people to invest in a shopping center in a low-income community in Portland uh, as a way of beginning to build ownership of these commercial assets. Another thing to look at is uh, among the several dozen uh, uh, portals out there for local investment, there's one called Small Change, which focuses exclusively on real estate initiatives, most of them quite small and interesting. Um, so yeah, I think, I think getting more community ownership of housing and more community ownership of, real, of, of commercial real estate is kind of a critical piece for rebuilding our communities. And if I could go just a step further, uh, two days ago on the front page of the New York Times, they said 110 people in the United States are renters. Um, and we estimate that 80% of them are going to experience uh, extreme hardship and 20%, the other 20% may lose their, their, their apartments. Um, and so we need, we have an affordable housing crisis that we have to fix in a hurry. And I think all the work that Schumacher did sort of laying the groundwork for community land trusts is what we need to build off of. A couple of questions here just around, um, Judy, what you had mentioned around sort of the indigenous wisdom that you received over the years and um, any thoughts that you have on, on sort of a vision for how indigenous approach might apply to money and the economy? Well, I know um, for a fact that there are indigenous leaders and in, um, Native Americans uh, who are focusing on um, on local self-reliance, uh, that um, there's a number of hemp projects. Uh, Win Winona Leduc has one. Mm -hmm. I think um, a, a Dallas Goldsmith, a, a Goldtooth. I've heard him talk about um, that it's not just being against something, but creating the alternative uh, with local food systems, local energy systems, and so on. So I think if you look to what Native leaders are doing today, you'll find that they are in fact building local self-reliance in their communities. Uh, bringing back her heritage foods. Um, Don Mohawk um, 
a, a great now deceased uh, native leader was bringing back uh, white corn. Um, mm -hmm. We had an event with him at the at the White Dog where we made things out of white corn. So there's a lot, a lot of that uh, work going on. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I want to write a, an article called Follow the Indians. They know the, the way because I just th think so many times, um, you know, if you if you look around the world, it's indigenous people that are protecting Mother Earth um, that, you know, time after time, uh, indigenous people have uh, say two things. One, protect your mother uh, or respect your mother and protect your children, you know, mm -hmm. and that's something that white people don't do. We don't respect our Mother Earth. And we're not looking out after the seventh generation of our children, what will happen to them. So just in that basic piece of advice, respect uh, your mother and uh, protect your children. Um, if we just followed that, that would be enough. Uh, but I wanted to add one little thing about the, uh, the idea of community land trust. And that is the idea of, um, of investors uh, doing place-based investing to looking at how their investments can have synergy by investing in more than one business in a particular community um, to re um, re uh, revitalize a particular um, community. Um, and I, I'm a part of an impact fund that's doing that in Chester, PA, um, like uh, buying real estate on the, on the main street there uh, to keep it in the hands of, um, uh, of, of uh, people of color uh, and not have, it be, you know, have, have white developers come in there. Uh, and the same thing is going on. Another colleague is doing something similar in, in Kingston, New York. So I, I think this is um, is being addressed in some ways individually, um, but I think it is really important in land in the rural areas. Our young farmers need land to grow, uh, and we're never going to have um, equity in the rural areas unless there's more broad spread um, um, land ownership and the opportunity for young people to own land. Yeah. This sort of brings me to the theme of, of race, racial injustice more broadly, obviously a huge topic today, both you know, in the dialogue and in protests about historic and ongoing racism and exclusion in the institutions and the processes and in the financial system that we have. I wonder if each of you could just talk a bit about how your work um, addresses that or is sort of connected to that, this question everyone's asking about how do we undo these you know, 400 years of of racial inequity in our country, in the United States. Maybe, Michael, do you wanna start with that and then we'll go back to Judy? Yeah, uh, well, I guess one starting point for me and connecting with what Judy said is for me, uh, communities of color have to start with indigenous peoples. Um, and over the last two years, a lot of the work that I've started doing, uh, courtesy of the Northwest Area Foundation, is with uh, Native American communities, primarily in Montana and Oregon. And uh, I, I mean, I, these, are, these are economies that have been so systematically decimated. In fact, it's, it, there's just, uh, Today, I was sort of stunned and delighted to see that the Supreme Court has awarded half of the state of Oklahoma to the native tribes there. So we'll see what happens. I'm sure that, I'm sure we'll find a way to thwart it. But it's but I do think that um, the worse off the communities are, in a way, the more they need the tools of local economic development. Uh, that we have been working on. You know, poverty is not just the absence of resources. Poverty is the systematic leakage so that, that every time someone in, you know, in Anacostia here in Washington, D.C. spends a dollar, you know, 70 cents immediately leaves the community and doesn't come back because they're spending all their money in chain stores or it's the same thing in a Native American reservation. So trying to figure out ways to localize purchasing, localize investment, I think is pretty critical. And, and as I pointed out, you know, with crowdfunding, we've seen that those people that the capital markets have most excluded are communities of color. And, and I feel like local investing is a way of opening up that whole investment activity so that communities of color can invest in themselves. But more importantly, the rest of us can invest in communities of color 
through new mechanisms of local investment. Great, Judy, what do you think about this question of racial inequity yeah, and how um, your work connects? Well, it, it connects in two ways. I didn't mention yet uh, that another project of mine is called the Circle of Aunts and Uncles. And we're a micro um, a loan fund. Um, we have about 42 aunts and uncles and about um, 18 or 19 entrepreneurs that we've invested in over the last five years. So we provide uh, very small micro loans above the 12,000 at 3% interest uh, for three years. Um, and not only do we do that, but what we also provide are uh, human relationships that we um, have a small circle around each entrepreneur where we provide um, social capital, um, you know, connections, advice, um, and, and, and develop a real relationship so that we feel that, that, we, that the aunts and uncles and the nieces and nephews and the cousins and so on, that we are co-creating uh, the local economy that we want to live in. Um, and when the pandemic came and, the, and businesses were shut down, uh, all the aunts and uncles um, leaped to the defense, you know, of our uh, entrepreneurs. They were so worried about them. Um, and we raised money. Um, we did a GoFundMe campaign, and we were able to give each of our entrepreneur businesses $1,000 in, um, in April and then again $1,000 in May. Um, and then we, uh, I made up a guide to helping our local entrepreneurs um, by using, uh, buying, um, you know, um, gift certificates and shopping online and whatnot. Um, so um, then also, um, as far as all together now, um, you know, I think back on uh, what I think is an historic model uh, for addressing white supremacy. Uh, and that was the model of, of Gandhi um, in India and the strategy he used to free um, the brown people, basically, of India from white supremacy uh, by, by the English uh, rule of their country. Um, and how he went about it in his nonviolent way was to encourage local self-reliance and basic needs. Um, he's, he encouraged everyone to, to plant the, the, the garden so that you're self-reliant on food. Um, he said, throw all those British-made clothes in a fire and burn them up. You know, we can make our own clothes. We're already growing the, fla the flax seeds and the cotton here and then shipping it to England to be made into clothes. We can make the clothes here. Uh, so that's why you see him so often at the, uh, at the spinning wheel, because he's modeling um, uh, the ability of the Indian people to care for themselves and not, uh, and not be under the thumb, you know, of, of, uh, of, of the white supremacist in England. And I think the same thing is true today. I, I think that uh, corporate rule is a manifestation of white male supremacy, um, that white males control corporations. They might make it seem as though there's a place for women and people of color in there, but we're really just, you know, cogs in the wheel, uh, peons in the plantations, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, um, that um, we're not going to be free, um, and we're not going to have uh, racial justice and economic um, equality until we have ownership broadly spread. And that's not going to be to uh, corporations, unless you're talking about the stock stockholders who are also white. Um, but um, so, you know, uh, at all together now, um, we're, we are uh, uniting rural and urban communities to co-create local supply chains that will serve the needs of all. Um, and so, um, I mean, sort of examples of that um, in the in the Hemp Coalition, um, one of our members, Eric White, applied for a USDA grant. Uh, to start a school uh, to, to train new farmers on how to grow uh, organic hemp. Uh, so if we get this grant, which we'll know soon, we're waiting, uh, we want to make sure that we have at least 15% people of color. Um, I mean, it's up in the Delaware Water Gap where it's mostly a white na uh, neighborhood, but we can bring entrepreneurs from other parts of the, or farmers, young farmers from other parts of the state. So we want to make an all out effort that this school will, will train um, farmers of color um, in how to take part in this new uh, industry. Um, another one of our coalitions is plant medicine, which includes traditional plant medicine, um, CBD, uh, and medical marijuana. Um, so there we want to make sure that what we do um, benefits the communities that were damaged by the failed war on drugs, uh, i.e. Uh, communities of color. And how can we, as we develop these local supply chains, when we, when we see a gap in the supply chain, uh, our intention is to start a, so, uh, a social enterprise. Um, so we're looking at starting a social enterprise uh, that would process uh, the hemp. So after, as we train these hemp farmers, how can we help them have the value added of um, owning our own um, 
means for the processing. So it would be a cooperatively owned, a farmer owned um, processing facility. Um, and um, then also um, uh, in, in, the, in the area of the plant medicine, how can we develop a, a business, um, you know, kind of a business from the hood, you know, of making edibles um, um, that would employ um, and be owned by um, people in communities that were harmed by the war on drugs? How can we help those who were harmed? A, a lot of, uh, of young black men are still in jail for what white guys are making a ton of money from. And this is such an injustice and it's happening right now. Um, and so we're addressing that. We're also, we also do advocacy in our work um, to have the next um, uh, cannabis bill in Pennsylvania be one that is fair um, and inclusive um, and give special attention to those um, who were nonviolent drug offenders. How can we bring them into the new economy? Um, and also with uh, hempcrete. Uh, hempcrete is this amazing building material made, made from hemp. And the, uh, the coalition leader for our hemp group, um, Cameron McIntosh, um, has uh, spent time uh, training uh, a black leader in Kingston how to make hempcrete. And, and he will then uh, help uh, 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 black uh, homeowners, lo low-income homeowners um, you know, in Kingston to use hempcrete um, to insulate their houses. Um, and um, hempcrete is, absorbs carbons indefinitely. I mean, there's so many benefits to it. It's such a, a great uh, you know, product. So there's a number of different ways in which we're, um, we're uh, addressing racial inequality. We, we, we want to have that be a central theme of our work because as we build um, you know, a new economy, um, we want to make sure this is the time to make sure it's inclusive. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a, a, big, a big part of it. Uh, Bali itself now has a new name, A Common Future, um, and, uh, and they uh, have a, an intentional focus on uh, uh, racial um, justice. Um, and um, Rodney, I just uh, uh, asked Rodney uh, Foxworth, uh, the, um, the current ED of, of uh, Bali, what now called Common Future, uh, to join the National Advisory Board for our All Together Now um, PA, which uh, Michael has, uh, has agreed to be on as well because uh, I want to keep that tie with what they're doing and learn from um, what they're doing with racial injustice uh, at Common Future that we could apply and what we're doing that, that could help them. So we still have this national um, communication. Um, and, and speaking of that, I just wanted to mention that Laurie Hamill, who was a co-founder of uh, Bali and who was at our original retreat here in the Wiki Wacky Woods, <laughs> um, it has uh, taken leadership of Amoeba, um, which is a um, mm. Uh, also a, um, a, a, a national organization made up of small business, uh, networks of small businesses in different uh, communities. So we're excited about uh, the continuation of, 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 that, of, of that work. Great, thanks. I see a lot of themes here. I mean, this idea that um, money and resources are being drained from our communities. It's also being drained more quickly from specific communities over hundreds of years. Exactly. Um, huge, you know, and then like sort of how do you rebuild that? Um, I would just also add to this conversation, there needs to also, like, you, you in, a, in a, an economy where you don't have anything to start with, it's really hard to build from something. You might not have any money to invest in something new. Just at a larger level, we're going to have to think about how to allow reparations of some sort for the long-term economic injustice that has happened over many years. That means you don't have as much to start with when you engage. And so I think it's this combination of things, like correcting injustices, making sure that this, you don't keep draining from communities and from individuals and families over time. And then these like connections with individual entrepreneurs and businesses and sort of connecting to the local economy in a way that is just going forward. All those are sort of core pieces of this puzzle. Um, yeah. So I, I really appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I just uh, say sometimes these impact inv investment uh, Groups, angels, investors, and so on, think they're doing a good by investing in, uh, you know, companies, uh, black-owned companies. But yet they they charge, you know, an interest rate that that's pretty high. You know, I I, I don't feel like that's right to to be loaning money or investing in, in businesses where again you end up draining resources for, uh, from a low-income community. That we 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 should be more generous than this. Uh, I don't really think that uh, anybody should have to pay more than you know three or four percent interest. If you have a lot of money, then then it's your responsibility to share that with others who don't. And 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 that's a a part of moving from me to we that we have to confront you know as a society. Uh, how how do we how do we we each participate um, in, in in creating more 
a more just economy. And it, 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 and it means a lot of it has to do with sharing, of, of not being afraid that we're not going to have enough for ourselves if we share with people who don't have enough. Uh, get over it. <laughs> you know, that is what we have to do. And what we have to do really to survive as a civilization. I mean, we are in a, a perilous point right now uh, as a civilization of mankind uh, because of climate change and, and, and environmental deterioration. Um, and uh, we have to learn to work with each other and with nature. Um, and part of that is to begin to share in a very generous way and to cooperate and to get over this competition and individualism that has been such a um, a dangerous part of the of American mentality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm going to go to something that's a bit connected to this, but a, a slightly different tract. We have a question from Bill Marston about sort of the next generation of leaders. And who do you see um, that, and you don't have to mention individual people, you know, we don't have to, it doesn't have to be someone that's named, but maybe it is about how, how are you helping to foster, how are you seeing the rising leadership from young, the younger generation um, coming in to take on some of this work to further sort of the vision that you guys have held for a long time? I'd love to just hear any sort of perspectives on how to do that better and maybe where you're already seeing young leadership sort of taking this forward. So maybe start with Michael on that one. About four years ago, uh, I started to teach one course a year for Bard Business School, which is a sustainability-oriented business school um, started by Hunter Lovins, um, maybe, I guess it was eight, nine years ago. Um, and it's small, although it's growing this year to about 50 students per class. And what I think is, I mean, there's many things that are wonderful about this, but what I am really inspired by, by the students uh, that I teach, um, and honestly, the better expression is those students teach me, um, because mm -hmm. when I was their age, and I was, you know, the paradigm for social change after law school was, uh, you go work for Ralph Nader, and he teaches you how to raise money by begging for money from foundations and rich people. And through nonprofit work, that's how you change the world. And all corporations, all businesses were evil. And uh, I've over time come to realize that that paradigm is exactly wrong. I, I mean, yes, there are plenty of dangerous corporations, but there are plenty of dangerous nonprofits too, and a lot of ineffective ones. And I feel like we need to reorganize ourselves around businesses, around entrepreneurship, building the world we want to see with the values that we want. And so, yeah, I'm inspired by the students that I see. Uh, and how they apply those skills in building co-ops and land trusts and creative small businesses, each of which is solving some global problem. Uh, I would like to see this move into mainstream business schools. It hasn't moved far and fast enough, but I think this, this is the encouraging trend. Great. Judy, what about you? Yeah, um, my daughter, uh, um, was telling one of my friends that my mom hangs out with all these young people, especially these handsome young men. <laughs> and, I had really Are you still that. doing that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel so fortunate uh, to work with young people that most of the people um, that I work with and all together now are, are young, young leaders. Um, each of our coalition leaders um, are, are young people, uh, like my, my kids' age are, are younger. Um, you know, the, right now, I, I'm, I'm finding my role as an elder, um, you know, no longer an entrepreneur. Um, you know, I, when I sold my company, I moved from being an activist entrepreneur to an activist citizen, and it took me a while to get a handle on that, because at first I thought, you know, um, well, I have no power now that I don't have a business. You know, I'm only one person. And my girlfriend said, Judy, you've always only been one person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, so my work turned towards, you know, citizen activism. Um, and um, young people have, have been a big part of it. But now I'm 73 years old. Um, and my co-leader at All Together Now um, is a white male who's 68 years old. And so our agreement is that we will shepherd in this, uh, this new organization. We haven't even gotten any funding yet. We're all volunteers now, um, but uh, we hope we're about to, be, uh, to get funded. So 
we feel that we are, are stewarding this organization to get the proper funding, to get um, uh, the, the foundation ready to turn it over uh, to a more diverse and more uh, and youthful leadership. So that's that's our plan. Um, and um, you know, I I can't uh, I can't um, be more grateful uh, for the young people who are leaders in Black Lives Matter. Um, you know, I so look up to them. Um, you know, I uh, up here in the in the Poconos, uh, I went to a, a Black Lives Matter um, a protest, and I made my sign and I had my mask on and so on because um, uh, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and um, I realized that when I got there and heard the speakers that it had been organized by uh, young uh, uh, black girls, high school girls, um, uh, who organized this march. A thousand people showed up um, in a community that's predominantly white. So the marchers were over 50% white. And these young black uh, women were so art art articulate and so passionate and so powerful in their leadership and so touched they were in tears that we all showed up, you know, that they are leading us now. Um, and I, I was there as, as their hum, humble follower. Um, and that felt so right to me and so good to me. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's happening more and more. Um, and the, the Sunrise Movement, you know, um, the, the, the young people, um, there's no stopping them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they are on the path for justice and there is no turning around. They're never gonna give up. And, the, and they are <laughs> our future. Yeah, and they're fighting for their future. So they're you've got to, you can kind of see why exactly. <laughs> there's there is no giving up, right? It's exactly. their future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to turn just a bit to this um, the situation we find ourselves in today with the pandemic. Um, you know, U.S. is not faring well. We're not looking so good. We're like the pariah of the world right now in terms of our ability to respond collectively to a health problem. And I'm wondering, um, and and to me that sort of raises this like larger question of resilience and are we resilient as a community in terms of our health are we resilient in terms of our ability to take care of people with the unemployment rates what they are and people just sort of scrambling um, so many different pressures on families right now we don't really have a system to help with that in a sufficient way um, i'm wondering what you guys think uh, needs to be done to sort of address these like fundamental vulnerabilities that are being exposed uh, by the pandemic that's sweeping through our country Maybe go back to Michael to start with this one. Well, you can't underestimate the role of uh, knucklehead leadership in where we are. I mean, so, you know, if all other things were equal and we were the Canadians or the Australians or the Europeans, we would be in much better shape. But let's just set that aside and, and concede that I think what every community has realized in this pandemic is how vulnerable they are to forces that are outside their control. Um, and I think this is a theme of what, you know, we were pushing in Bali for years and years. Um, and, you know, I, I was reflecting on this at the beginning of the pandemic and uh, a smart kid who is working for me as an intern, he said, um, you know, uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't your, every, all of your work on local economy, uh, doesn't it, isn't it invalidated by David Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage? Because, you know, what David Ricardo said is that, you know, you should do one or two things that you do great and import everything else. Um, and I said to him, I said, well, you know, it turns out that half the things you make are actually cheaper than what you're going to import. So it doesn't make sense to import everything. But that's still not the right answer. The right answer is that the theory was just wrong. The theory was wrong because it never took into account issues of resilience. And so I think now we need to develop a whole new theory of economic development that is rooted in greater degrees of self-reliance diversification of our economy, being able to withstand whatever is foreseeable, you know, food shortages, capital flights, pandemics, wars, terrorism. It's not that we're on our own. We're never going to be completely on our own. But the truth is, is that for most communities, what really kept us alive over the last, you know, 16, 17 weeks 
is that we have stronger local food systems now than we did 20 years ago. And a lot of that work really has paid off. And we now need to just go further and try to get ourselves as self-reliant as possible, uh, not just food, but energy and clothing and housing and healthcare, go through the list. That has to be the new objective of economic development. Yeah, and I wonder, I have a really good question here from our friend Steve Weinberg about the role of local governments in all this. I mean, we talked about this not being about individuals and about connecting out, and obviously our first sort of form of government at a local level would be our city or town. And I'm curious what you guys think needs to happen in terms of cities and, and lo localities, local governments engaging on this um, in terms of their budgets, their planning, how they're getting citizens to work together. And are there specific examples in the country where you think local governments are really starting to do this right? So I'll just give you a quick answer. I, I, I've had conversations, it's like a local government a day over the last two weeks. So yesterday was Riverside, next Monday is Las Cruces, the day before was Montgomery County where I live, day before that, Washington, DC. They're all asking this question. And among the answers that I give is I say, okay, think of what are those initiatives that you can take that cost almost nothing because you have very little money right now. What are the initiatives that cost almost nothing and yet would have an incredible stimulus impact? So for example, changing the rules of procurement. So you're buying more local as a local government more of the time. Costs nothing to change the rules, greatly stimulates your economy. Uh, getting rid of stupid economic attraction, economic development attraction programs. They waste about a hundred billion dollars a year from state and local governments. Get rid of those, save the money for other things try to promote local investment among the people in your community. You could create local investment funds that are run by the city and people put money in privately that then could be used for affordable housing or energy efficiency or whatever the priorities are. Or if you're interested in affordable housing, just changing the zoning laws to make it easier for people to build small, tiny houses on their property as a way of providing more homes for more people. Uh, you know, there's been changes in law in California, Oregon, Montgomery County, where I live. Uh, I think these things are all possible. None of these things cost anything, and yet they make an incredible difference on how resilient your city can become. Yeah, great. And Judy, what about you in terms of your interactions and influence on local governments or or the sort of role you see them playing yeah um i'll answer that but i also want to go back to the pandemic um mm -hmm. but um so one of my other nonprofits is called proud pennsylvania um and so we partner with the food and water action pack i'm the chair of that pack uh, to raise money to elect uh, state legislators uh, who um, are against uh, opposed to fracking um, and who, in general, um, stand up for com community uh, well-being over uh, in defense of, of corporate power, whether it's you know putting factory farms in your community or putting pipelines through your community, whatever. Um, and so, um, and then we have a proud Pennsylvania legislative working group uh, that that discusses these issues in upcoming legislation and so on. Uh, you know, with our our leaders. Um, but uh, getting back to the pandemic question, I just wanted to say, Marianne, when you brought up, uh, you know, the, 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 the uh, situation in this country and how, uh, how terrible it is in the way that we've uh, not been able to come together. Um, and I, I think we, we see at play here uh, two opposing worldviews, um, you know, that uh, not to be too political here, but Trump and his allies really have a worldview of separation, that it's a them and us world and that we have to dominate in order to um, prevail. Um, and, you know, where the other worldview is one of we're all interconnected. We have to cooperate. We have to work together. Um, and that, it, that it's not about, you know, individual freedom. It's, a, it's about, you know, uh, freedom for all of us. Um, um, and, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, Martin Luther King used to say, uh, our choice is between community and chaos. And that's what we see right now. I mean, there's chaos because people are not choosing community. They're not choosing to work together in harmony. Um, and, and this is a, a very uh, dangerous um, and worrisome um, reaction to this pandemic because we have 
we're going to have more pandemics and we have climate change to deal with. And the only way we're going to uh, survive is, is by coming together and, and cooperating with each other. So this is a real showdown. Uh, but I just wanted to say, you know, um, you know that, that the pandemic has been, a, 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 in some ways, has worked on the side of local localization because uh, people see, saw firsthand how the, the centralized industrial food system collapsed and, fa and failed to provide for us, the grocery stores being empty, where the local farmers and the local food entrepreneurs uh, responded um, by pivoting and, and, and creating local systems that kept the food flowing. And it, in Philadelphia, it was just uh, amazing to see, um, you know, uh, in the circle of aunts and uncles, uh, I like to say we have a butcher, a baker, and three ice cream makers, you know, and they all buy from local farmers. And the butcher, she had uh, bricks and mortar shops, and she, she overnight uh, created a, a website where she, she now delivers, you know, the meat to homes. Um, and um, she, she has so much business that she can't keep up with it. Um, same with the bread bakers. Uh, the ice cream makers and the, uh, and, the, and the pop shop, they went together and created a joy box that people can order to be delivered to their house that has ice cream, um, or gourmet popsicles, um, beer, <laughs> uh, and uh, I forget what all uh, in the joy box. And um, so um, uh, all together now, I'll put out a guide to finding local food during the pandemic that listed all these different ways. Uh, one of my favorite uh, farmers, a Green Meadow farm, used to deliver, uh, all their customers were restaurants. So the restaurants closed down. What are they going to do? Well, they created a, a food box, um, and through social media and our guide, um, we're able to connect with households, um, and they kept their income um, level. Uh, with uh, pre-pandemic, hmm. but it's a lot more work um, to deliver to uh, you know a lot of uh, people versus a few uh, clients. Um, so anyway, it was very. I, I think that um, a, a people are are are, are woke up <laughs> now. You know uh, that our survival is in jeopardy. That we cannot depend on long-distance supply chains. They're going to be disrupted by pandemics and, and climate change as the weather becomes increasingly severe. Um, that we need to um, to build local supply chains. Um, and that's, and we only have uh, uh, 10 years uh, to turn this thing around. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think it's a, 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 that it's, like I say, people are motivated now. Uh, people want to know what they can do. How can they help build local self-reliance? Um, they get it. Uh, I think it's like an intuitive survival instinct uh, that we need to, to, to become self-reliant as regions. Yeah. I have a couple mentions of here, and we've talked about this already, this sort of idea of trust being on the, at the basis of everything. Um, and Michael Walburn has this quote, he says, Professor Mary Wood has referenced the public trust, that public trust is the slate upon which all constitutions are written. And ask, asking about, you know, like, we don't need to develop everything new. There's actually these old tools like the public trust doctrine that sort of can undergird where we're going as well. And I wonder if you guys have any thoughts about public trust at a broader level, perhaps than our public institutions like local governments or even the federal government. How do you start to rebuild public trust in a country that has seen such massive failure around dealing with a public health crisis? Where does that trust come from again? I mean, we've mentioned some of the ways, but at a, at a larger level, maybe at the, at the state level or just, you know, at the local level, how does that bubble up and, and create trust for um, sort of these, the larger ways that we need to act together? Yeah, well, I, I would say that the next agenda item, you know, when we don't have uh, death in, in the form of pandemic kicking at the door is decentralizing our politics, uh, or what some of us call subsidiarity. I, I think that it's not complete failure in the pandemic. There is greater success uh, with state and local officials, not uniformly. I mean, some have performed very poorly. Um, my governor, who is an endangered species, a moderate Republican, um, has actually done pretty well. And, and it inspires some hope about me that if we move the authority further down, it can be helpful. Now, you still need things at a national level, supplies, testing, and so forth. But I feel like, you know, the failure of our government, not just in the pandemic, but in so many other areas, is a reminder of the 
basic principles of subsidiarity. And these were, you know, to me, this is what drew me to the Schumacher Center many years ago was, you know, E.F. Schumacher, small is beautiful. He, Schumacher did not just mean that economically, he meant politically. He meant that we trust, we build trust and out of trust comes governance. And the whole idea of subsidiarity is if you can do it in your backyard, go ahead and do it. In fact, you should do it right away. If there's some reason you can't do it, kick it up to the next level, local government. Can't do it there, go to the county and so forth. But what it says is that ultimately, most of the power belongs at the local level. Most of the taxes should be spent at the local level. Most of the activity. And right now in our country, it's fundamentally flipped. Uh, I think we should look at Switzerland as a model on how to reorganize our country. No one knows who the head of Switzerland is, and even the Swiss, because it is so decentralized. And yet they are amazing performers in terms of social equity, environment. Um, and I, we are being called upon to rethink our democracy. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> So we have just a few minutes left, and I'm wondering if each of you can reflect on sort of what lifts your spirits in this time of transition, change, sadness, but also like great potential. What sort of like keeps you going and buoys you up as we, as we, uh, you know, face these times together. So let's, Michael, we'll start with you and then we'll end with Judy. Um, well, one thing that buoys me up is that I'm getting remarried in August. So <laughs> I, I, I love is in the air, even when there's a pandemic. Um, <laughs> Zoom, what, Zoom wedding, right? We're having a Zoom wedding. <laughs> You're all invited. Yeah. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you what, what really has made me very happy the last few months is that, you know, the pandemic is so overwhelming. And if you can find one way of redefining the problem personally, speaking of, <laughs> if you can find one way of redefining the problem so you can solve your little personal piece of it, um, it's very empowering. So I decided uh, about six weeks ago, you know what, I can't save every local business that's struggling now, but I'm going to adopt at least one of them. So my favorite local business in this area is called Busboys and Poets. Uh, it's a combination restaurant, bar, bookstore, event, gathering place, art gallery. Andy Shalal is a brilliant entrepreneur. I wrote Andy a $1,000 check and I feel grateful that I could afford to do that. I wrote him a $1,000 check and I said, Andy, I'm gonna prepay for next year's meals because I want you to keep those staff there and I want other people to follow this. And he was so thrilled. He actually gave me a 20% bump up and I got a 20% rate of return on my investment. Um, but I just encourage everyone here to adopt some of your local businesses, preferably run by people of color and help, help bring the economy back alive. And that will make you unbelievably happy. Thanks, Judy, what's your? Well, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm so inspired by young people uh, and by young leadership. Uh, and not only their youth, uh, but the multicultural nature um, of these movements. Um, uh, you know, uh, watching the Black Lives Matter uh, has just been so, so inspiring to me. Um, and, you know, I think, uh, uh, and obviously it's coming from the heart. Um, and when I think back on my own transformational moments, um, they always come with, uh, from the heart. Um, you know, when I made that decision to uh, share with my competitors uh, back in the old days at the White Dog, um, I didn't do it because I figured out in, in, my, in my head that it was the right thing to do. I, I felt it in my heart because of my love of the pigs and the farm animals <laughs> and my love of nature and, and small farmers. So that's why I made that change. Um, and I can give you other examples of that. And I think that's true for everyone. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if this is the case or not, but for me, I feel that the episode with George Floyd was seeing that blue knee on the black neck and hearing George, George Floyd plead for, uh, for his life and call out for his mother. Um, that, 
that moment, um, you know, I mean, it makes me almost cry to think of it. it. It opened my heart, and I think it opened the hearts of of white people uh, who are just oblivious, you know, uh, to, to this fact that black people. I mean, when white people are afraid, we call the police. You know, we, we think they're going to come and protect us. Well, what if the police were the enemy? Um, and now this isn't always the case. Obviously, a policeman help everybody at different times, but having that fear that you don't know for sure if the police are going to help you or they're against you um just pulls the rug out from under you you know and so i think that there that this black lives matter is is very much our heart opening heart based movement uh and they and the leaders there talk about love you know that this is coming from a place of love um and so uh you know i think that that is is, is hugely powerful um and you know, I, I think the other thing that's coming from the present moment in the pandemic is, is this whole idea that life is more important than money. You know, um, and you know that's something that we've been saying. You know, in this localization movement, um, and it's again such a drama um, to see our president uh, coming from a place where money is more important than life. You know, he wants businesses to be open. He wants the economy to be great so he can get reelected, re blah, blah, blah. And, you know, if, if, if some people die, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think that the population in general is saying, no, life is more important than money. You know, um, I mean, not that people are not uh, in pain from the economy, um, but in the end, um, we, we want an economy that uh, works in harmony with life. Uh, and that, to me, is is the uh, is the crucial, you know, the crucial element um, that you know we we you know we have a, a an economy that uh, is destroying life on Earth, um, and and we need to change that. Um, and I and I I feel like you know I want to say to my my fellow baby boomers, um, boomers come home, stop. <laughs> Stop traveling around the world. I mean, now we can't travel anyway, but uh, what tends to be the tradition, you know, in our culture is when you retire, you spend your time traveling. Um, well, that, that can work, cannot work now. Um, the boomers, uh, the elders need to come home and help the younger people uh, to create a new economy uh, that's low carbon and, and just, um, and we need everybody to participate in that. Um, and I, I, I feel that ultimately, that human beings, indigenous people living with the Eskimos, one of the things I realized is that they knew their place in the web of life. And I think indigenous people do understand that they are just, the humans are only a strand in the web of life. White people don't get that. Um, and so, you know, we have to come to terms with this. We have to come to terms with our relationship with nature and our relationship with each other. Um, and it's human su supremacy, um, really white human supremacy that is destroying the web of life. Um, and so we need to find our place in the web of life no longer as the extractors and the, and the exploiters, um, but rather, you know, as the lovers, you know, as the lovers of life and of each other. Um, and, that, and that is what gives me hope because I feel that that is the direction that we're moving. And if we don't move that in that direction, that civilization is going to end. Um, but I still have hope, <laughs> and, and the hope really lies um, uh, in our ability to, 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 to love and, and to open ourselves to, to feeling. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. I, I hear so many themes of hope and renewal in a time of, of struggle um, that, that are really helpful to hear. And this question of like, what is an economy actually for? It's not for money, <laughs> it's for life. And when you have that view, it's really clear what's working for life and what isn't. Um, and I also find a lot of solace, like you said, Judy, like a lot of people heard the words of a dying man who was um, asking for help. Um, right. And I think actually op it opened our hearts, it yep. opened many people's hearts yes. in a way that you know, maybe wouldn't have happened in a time when we we're too busy running around in our own little lives. Mm -hmm. In a way, this is a time where we're being forced to pause. Yes. And to think about who could get sick, who's being oppressed currently and has been for, for centuries. Yeah. You know, this sort of like pause to, to see yes. um, is really important. Absolutely. Um, and I think both of you guys exemplify um, sort of pausing in your own lives, seeing what's needed and working from there. 
Um, and while this is a lecture, supposedly, I think, I think what we're saying here is that everyone on this call, everyone who's hearing this quote lecture, has the same capacity to look at, to see, to look at what's around you, what needs to change, what you can do to be a part of that, and, and connecting with others through that. Um, so thank you guys both for sharing your stories and your journeys. Um, and I think all three of us encourage everyone to look back at your own life and what you can do and how you can see what's going on and connect and make that difference um, because that is what transforms the world, um, one person and one community and one country at a time. Um, so thank you guys both and thank you everyone for tuning in today and for um, being here for this important conversation. Thank you, Judy and Michael, so much. Thank you, Mary. Let's all go to the bar now. Come on. <laughs> no, I want my kid to go to school this fall. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.